and welcome everyone. Good evening. I hope there's someone there and that Phil and Sarah and I aren't just sort of talking to ourselves. So, um, but uh, welcome to this joyous occasion. Um, I'm Charlie Shepherd, and this is the launch of When the Sky Falls. And um, unfortunately, it's not in an indie bookshop, but we have got some cheap wine here. Um, and um, and you're in for a treat tonight because um, the lovely Sarah is going to interview Phil um, and then you're going to get your chance to ask some questions at the end. Um, so just remember to put your questions on the, I don't know what it is, on the YouTube something or other. Is that right? Yeah, the YouTube chat. Ah, okay, that's it. <laughs> Um, so before Phil and Sarah get started, um, I just wanted to say a few words um, about this book and, um, and the experience of working with Phil on it. So um, I first heard about this idea from Phil quite a few years ago now, isn't it, Phil, I think? And, um, and at that time, I wasn't his editor, but I would always count myself as his friend. And, um, and Phil told me about this idea and you're going to start crying, aren't you, Phil? I can see sure. it. <laughs> And I just said, oh, my God, that's such an amazing idea. You've got to write that book. It's going to be brilliant. Um, but for various reasons, Phil wasn't ready to write that book and he wasn't in the right place to write that book. Um, but periodically, I would ask him and I'd ask his agent, Jody, what's happening about that book that Phil was going to write about that gorilla? And, um, and yet yeah, he still wasn't ready and it still wasn't kind of happening. And then uh, probably about two years ago now, I heard the wonderful news that Phil had started to write the book. Um, and then I heard the even better news that Phil wanted me to work on it with him. And that was incredible and such an honor. And, um, and it was the start of something very special. Um, now, when I went to my first publishing party, which is over a quarter of a century ago, um, when I got over the shock that the food and drink were both free, the thing that I, the thing that I really noticed was that some of the older editors had authors that, that they looked like they were genuinely their friends. And I remember thinking, oh my God, you must really know you've arrived when an author is also your friend. And that was always an ambition of mine. And I must say, you know, over the years, it has come true and I have, um, been lucky enough to count several authors as friends, but none more so than you, Phil Earl. So um, yeah, this you were a friend before, and I'm lucky, happy to say that you're still a friend now, even after and I've edited you. So that's yeah. <laughs> you. I mean, it has been an amazing experience. You have dug so deep for this book. Every time I've asked you to do a little bit more, you have. Every time I've asked you to make me cry in a scene, you have. Um, you know. If I've asked, if I've wanted to edit something out, you've let me and you've never moaned and you've come back for more and more and more with always a cheers pal or a thanks mate. And it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and it has been an emo emotional journey, um, I think. And, and I know you've poured your heart into this book and, and, it, and it really shows. So yes, we're not in an indie bookshop. No, we haven't got a glass of wine. But I think the fact that we're, we're having to do the launch like this and no one else is on the Zoom is testament to the fact that you have so many friends. Because I think basically you've broken Zoom or something, haven't you? And because uh, we had so many RSVPs, we've had to change how we do it. But but that is because you're not only my friends, you are the friend of so many people. You're so loved and any success that comes your way is so well deserved and I couldn't be happier for you. It's had an incredible first response and reception this book. So although our editorial journey ends tonight with this book, it's the beginning of the onward journey for this book and I think it is going to go to some wonderful places so enjoy your night thank you so much for the honor of letting me be your editor and um yeah I'll leave you to to it so thank Thanks, you man. thank you <laughs> and just for me thank you everyone for coming tonight and uh just I, I'm not going to make a big speech because we just want to get chatting to Sarah but um yeah, this it's been it's been it's been amazing working on this book, and uh, there's a few people I do want to thank. I want to thank the early readers, people like Chaz and Dave, Shannon, Simon, Dr. Turney, David Ficklin, Sarah sat here, uh, Jody, Emily, Molly, and Jane at United Agents. Jody's been amazing with me for years. We've worked together for nearly ten years now, and it's a joy to work with you, Jody. Thank you, everyone at Anderson, 
you know, right through from Klaus and Mark, uh, Jack, Chloe, Eloise, uh, Sarah, um, Paul, you've been magnificent, Rob, amazing. And, and Charlie, Charlie, Charlie was the first editor that I ever showed anything that I'd ever written to. And that was when I was working at Random House. And she said three words to me uh, when she read my first attempt at writing something. And she said to me, you can write. And that was enough. That kind of galvanized me for the next sort of seven years of rejection. So thanks so much, Charlie. It's uh, Charlie sent me a note. When I sent her the first draft, she sent me a note. She said, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, my God, you've got a lot of work to do. But if you get to the top of the mountain, you, the view up here is, is, is brilliant. And that absolutely kept me going. So thank you, mate. Um, thank you to uh, my mum and my dad and John and Angela, as always, and especially to, to my kids and uh, to Albie, Elsie, Stam, to Rufus and BB, and also to Lou, who has been just the most seismic part of me uh, writing this book and, and sitting here tonight. So love yous. That's it. I didn't cry. Get in. That's it. Well, oh, you haven't cried yet, but we've got loads of time, mate. <laughs> Hi, Phil. Hi. So this feels a little bit weird because we're not used to publicly speaking to one another. It's normally private and um, horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> so unlike Charlie, um, I did not have an ambition to be your friend, but it just happened. Um, and I think that was about eight years ago, nine years ago. And I think we've both kind of come on this journey together, like a personal difficult journeys that we've both had in our lives. Yeah. Um, and the same with the writing, like the writing has been really up and down for both of us as well. Um, but I just wanted to talk about where this book did come from, first of all, not necessarily the idea for the book, because I, I would like to talk about that a little bit later, but like, what was it? Charlie talked about you really digging. And I'd just love you to talk a little bit about that. And I know a little bit about that because I know that writing was, stalled for a while and you were finding it tricky and, and what was it about this story or this book or what did you do to make this thing happen because it's it's huge and the book is amazing and I will talk about how amazing the book is in a bit but um yeah I just wanted to know where it came from I'd hit um I'd carried the idea I've carried this idea around for about I think six seven maybe eight years um but for a long time, I didn't sort of feel ready to tell it. I mean, I always had a very visceral reaction to the story, which we'll get onto in a minute. But um, there is a moment for me when, when a story hits you. And for me, it's visceral. When a story presents itself, I, you know, when I'm in schools, I talk about being surrounded by stories and it ends up being like a bit of a motto, but it's not glib. I, I genuinely believe it. And, and the reaction I had when I was told the story that became the sort of backbone of When the Sky Falls, um, the reaction I had was, was physical. I knew the second I heard the story that I had to write it down, but I didn't feel ready for a long time. I felt like there was a lot of what ifs to ask about until I could get that story ready to move onto the page. But also I think personally, I'd found myself a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a left turn that I hadn't expected. So it's about sort of, about five, five years ago, I found myself stuck. I hadn't written a word in, in two years, pretty much, and didn't think I ever would again. I literally thought I was, I was done. I think, you know, I was, um, I don't know, 15, 16 books in by then, uh, struggling to, to sort of get noticed, struggling to, you know, let's be real about it, trying to earn money out of being a writer as well. And that was, that was difficult. And then everything kind of went uh, dreadfully wrong, really. It, so just on a personal level. <laughs> As it level, does in everyone's lives. <laughs> yeah. it, everything just, it, overnight, everything just seemed to turn left when I wanted to go right. Mm -hmm. and, and I found, you know, that the, you know, on a, from a family level, it all kind of fell apart, really. And, um, and I felt for two years like I was done. I felt like there was nothing left to say. I couldn't possibly envisage a time when I would be, have the, 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 the clearness of head uh, uh, to write again. And it was two years and it was two hard years. And, it, and I felt pretty busted really, I think during those two years. But the, the wonderful thing was that as that two years started to come sort of towards an end, this story just started to represent itself. And with that, the feeling came back, the, um, the excite, that visceral thing that I was talking about. For me, when a story presents itself, I, I get I get goosebumps. The hair stand up. My brain prickles. I literally feel like I'm I'm plugged into the mains. 
and never more so than with this book. Never more so. Uh, I've never felt, I don't know if I will ever feel this way about an idea again, because it, I felt the connection to it so strongly, in part because of the person that told me the story was a very important person to me. And I'd been estranged for that per from that person for two or three years by that point. Mm. But also because um, what I didn't realise at the time was that it was going to allow me, and I didn't even realise while I was writing it, but the stuff I was feeling at that time about, about, about loss and about abandonment and about family, all those things started to present themselves through the novel. And it's really interesting because Charlie touched on it. We talked about this book for a while. And, and, and Charlie had said to me before I started writing this book, when I was stuck, when I was in a, in a bit of a state, she said to me, you will find a way of using this stuff. You will write, her example was, you will write your Madame Doubtfire, you know, because I'd lost my kids half the week and the loss of that. And it still does, I found that very difficult. And, and what I didn't realise, because I don't plan novels, I sit down with an idea, a start and often an end, uh, and that's it, there's nothing in between. It's how you get from A to B that excites me. So what I didn't realise was as I wrote, I was, without realising, I was channeling this, this difficult stuff. And actually, it has been the greatest gift creatively that I, I could have had. I did, without realising, I put all that, without sounding like an idiot and really pretentious, all that pain, I, yeah. I channeled it, I think. Yeah, I recognise that and I relate to that. And I'm wondering, you know, is what you're saying that through the, pro the, the process itself was healing or that you needed to be healed in order for the process to begin or it was kind of a little bit of both? I guess it's a bit of both. I mean, I, I didn't even realise while I was doing the first draft, I don't think that, that you know, the, the sort of, the things that Joseph feels really was the stuff that I felt. When, when, when I wrote Being Billy, which is my first book, that yeah. I seem to write well, I think, about angry boys. And I don't Definitely. know Definitely. I really want to talk about that in a bit. Yeah. And that, that's not me, actually. I'm yeah. not, I don't think I am an angry boy. But I think <laughs> I was probably angry at the cards that I felt I'd been dealt at that time. Yeah. And I think that allowed me to, to tap into it, really. Yeah. So before we I mean, go any further, then, do you want to... Um, tell me where you did get the idea what what is the because there might be people watching who have not come across the book this is their introduction yeah. to the book so if you just kind of can summarize the book give us your elevator pitch and then I'd love to know where the idea came from because um that's a little story in itself so if you want an elevator pitch if you want that sort of pithy one or two lines I don't because I know it's really hard to do you can you've no. got as long as you need <laughs> my favorite one that we have because I work in publishing as well as you know the favorite one I ever had from an agent was this is Artemis Fowl meets Fifty Shades of Grey which I just thought would just sound like <laughs> the worst thing in the world ever ah I don't need to read that book um but it's basically I guess you could say this is this is good night Mr Tom mm. or Machine Gunners with a, a healthy dash of, of Northern Kestrel for a knave, I guess. I mean, those were my kind of touchstones, I think. And, and it came, it came a, about because of a really innocuous, innocent conversation with who, the, a man who at that point was my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on holiday and we were sat outside his caravan. and We were just sat having a beer in the late afternoon. Uh, and he said to me, he, we just started talking about his dad. And, and I asked what his dad had done during the war. And he said, my dad wasn't able to fight. From memory, he, I think he said to me, his dad had asthma and he wasn't able to fight. So he was part of the home guard. And every time the air raid siren rang, his dad's only job was to grab a rifle and leg it to Bellevue Zoo, right, in Manchester. And once he got to the zoo, he had to position himself outside the lion's enclosure with the rifle trained through the bars. Because if the Luftwaffe dropped that bomb that blew out the wall of the lion's cage, his dad's job was to, was to kill the lion before it went on the rampage. Yeah. And that was it for me. I was like, where? where I do, do remember I... you telling me that and thinking, is there any way I could steal that idea? <laughs> I mean, he's not writing at the moment anyway, so yeah, I can have to do it in six months. <laughs> um, and you changed the story somewhat because you used a primate. So um, just kind of give us your story. So your story is yeah. we've got this boy called Joseph. That's right. I mean, immediately I, I entered into that kind of what if thing, you know, like that thing that writers do, you know, like what if. And, and the first thing that popped into my head I mean, I knew instantly I was going to write it at some point. I had to. It was like, you know, I was on fire. I felt like I was on fire. It, the idea was that 
much of a gift. And I loved the guy so much, the guy who gave me the idea. It felt like a way of kind of honouring him a little bit as well. And then, but I started to ask, what if, you know, what if that rifle had ended up in the hands of a 12 year old boy instead of a responsible adult? What if that 12 year old boy was furious at the world? What if the, and then I, I started to think about um, the Second World War. I started to think about those kind of tropes that you see about the Second World War. Evacuees came to mind. So very early on, I had this notion of this scene in a, you know, we've all seen it in those, in those kind of war films of the packed, train station in London and children being shoehorned onto trains and shipped out to safety. What if there was one young boy whose behaviour was so poor that he's been sent in the opposite direction? So, you know, you what you have is 12-year-old Joseph. Mum, mm -hmm. we don't know where she is. Dad's been packed off to war. Grandma can't cope with him. And his anger is so out of control that he's been packed off down to the city to live with a woman that he's never, ever met before and doesn't know who she is from Adam. So and when we meet him, he's really resistant to her. Yeah. Uh, even though they do develop this bond and sort of a, a strange family unit. Yes. Um, is developed. But I want to kind of stay with this point of writing angry young people because that was how I met your work by reading Being Billy um, and gone out Saving Daisy. Um, and heroic, and I think that you have a real gift for writing these characters, these characters who are very angry, but of course we come to love them because you show us <laughs> where this anger, you know, is rooted, and you do that so brilliantly, but I just do wonder why you write, because I know you so well, and as you say, you're not an angry boy, you're not, and you, you are so the opposite of that, and I wonder what is it that you're trying to work out through the writing or what is it that interests you about these kinds of characters i'm going to have some of my um alcohol free beer now while you good talk. <laughs> i mean first of all my therapist is is earning a fortune trying to work this out as we speak you know what is the obsession with it but it's it's um i mean with, with, with the earlier books with, with billy and daisy in particular it was about trying to understand or empathise with those people's lives, those young children's lives, that how does it feel to have been abandoned, with, in Billy's case, not just once, but twice in his life? How would you get adopted and then given up? Do you know what I mean? Because that was yeah. something that's not often talked about. But but with, with, with Joseph, I mean, I, I root for the underdog. I, I think those are the books as a reader that I'm attracted to. You know, so books like Goodnight, Mr. Tom, and The Machine Gunners, you know, Westall, Charles in, in Westall is a brilliant underdog. You know, I'm always attracted to those to those characters. But a lot of it does come back to those kids. I've I've worked, I I've worked with 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 children that had been written off by the age of eight, you know, or younger sometimes. And I am I am fascinated by young people's ability to stun and astound us. And and I don't ever, you know, I don't believe that any child is born evil. I always feel like there are, there are really good reasons why children behave in a certain way. And I think I do, you know, I did it even with the Story Street books, with, with the middle grade stuff I wrote with, with, um, with the war next door, Masha Milner, who's the street bully who appears in all the books. He's, he's an awful character, but I, I was determined to give him his moment where we could see why he was like he was. And it was yeah. the same with Joseph. I just find it endlessly fascinating to try and understand why people behave in a certain way, especially angry young people, because I see, I saw the potential in those young people that I worked with, you know. Uh, and I hope this doesn't feel like a tedious question, but also the idea of how important education is in giving young people power because of Joseph's, you know, his the way he has been disconnected from school because he can't read. Yeah. Um, and again, that's kind of touching on some of your earlier work as well, where there's this disconnect from education and how valuable you, I think you see it, or you, you seem to write about that. Yeah. You know, I it, feel, I feel dead jammy, right? I, I grew up, I, I am, it's not a very great thing to admit. I loved school. I had a great time. You know, I was into sport and I was into drama and my school catered for those things beautifully. But, but I know a lot of kids don't. And, and for those kids that find life difficult, school is often the thing that compounds it, you know, because they're there for so many hours a day and their life can be unbelievably miserable. 
and, and, and again, you know, I think it might have been Charlie who said to me in the very early days of my writing that you have to love your characters as much as you love yourself, as much as you love family, but you've got to do the most awful things to them. You've got to take their lives and wring, every, especially as underdogs, you've got to wring every bit of emotion and drama out of their lives as you can. So for me, it's about the greater the obstacles you set, you know, the, the, the greater the salvation when they stumble their way over them, I think. And um, I mean, ironically, since I wrote When the Sky Falls, two of my three kids have been diagnosed with, with dyslexia, which is a bizarre thing. But it's a huge, you know, and I just thought, you know, in 1940, yeah. what on earth was known about it then? You know, you would have just been put, for a young boy to walk into school and say that the words are dancing on the page, they, yeah. they would have been calling the men in white coats, you know, so it, it compounds that misery for me. I mean, I'm key, I'm skipping around. I had sort of a, a plan for what I was going to ask, but actually I want to skip to something that I was going to ask later, which is about how modern the book feels, because you talked about his, its historical setting, setting it um, in the 40s, and then also, you know, writing about these issues in a way that does feel so modern. Was that a conscious decision? Because obviously you had to do masses of research. Um, I tend to not write historical fiction <laughs> for that reason. And I just think, is there not a, is there not, um, I don't know, that you, that you would want to make it feel really historical, but in that, in that way, kind of turn your back on the issues of today, but you haven't done that. And, yeah. and how did you tackle that? Because that's hard because, you know, everything that I've read of yours is, contemporary yeah yeah I, um, I wanted to I wanted to stay with I wanted to honor the story that Peter told me in the first place you know for me there was something about honoring the the second world war setting to be honest also I wanted to test myself you know it's hard right and I work in publishing as well so I know this but uh, the book industry is, is a brilliant industry but we are obsessed by by the debuts by the, the bright young shiny things, you know, and, and quite rightly in a lot of cases as well, because great, exciting, fresh writing. But for me, I think I'd reached a stage in my career where commercially I wasn't, didn't feel like I was cutting through to where I wanted to be. And so I thought, you know, I, I was worried, if I'm honest, about where, would publishers still take a chance on me in something that I'd written? Would booksellers still want to read something that I'd, I'd written? So it felt like something to challenge myself, to maybe sort of reinvent myself a little bit. But if I'm honest, the research didn't really get in the way. And um, again, a really good bit of advice I took was from another writer. There's a brilliant writer for, for, for teenagers called Sophie McKenzie, who writes brilliant thrillers. And they're often quite high concept. There's often quite a lot of science involved, genetics and stuff like that. Uh, and I had a really interesting, I used to work on Sophie's books at SNS and Sophie talked to me once about how, because I asked her about the research and she said, I do research, but I don't let it get in the way of the plot. Um, and I always carried that with me, and it's really fortunate because I'm a terrifically lazy reader. I, I'm I'm difficult to please in terms of books, just because I struggle with it. I I, I there are a lot of books I don't finish because I just don't have a good concentration span. Um, so for me, the research was not so much reading around the subject, but watching around the subject. Okay. Um, uh, films. So I went to things like Hope and Glory. I did watch the, the the John Thor adaptation of Goodnight Mr. Tom just for the kind of period feel. Uh, I, I went back and watched a little bit of the old classic BBC adaptation of The Machine Gunners on YouTube, which I managed to find, which was like seminal when I was a kid. But also it's just things like Google Images. I started Im Googling um, uh, Blitz London and, and just seeing what came up. And I know that sounds really basic, but there were a lot of images in that book uh, in, in the book that came from me googling so there's quite early in the book I talk about a, as Joseph drives through London on the bus for the first time he sees a boy sat outside a bookshop and the walls have been blown out and he sat on a pile of rubble reading books and then he re finishes the book and he goes back and puts it in the bombed out bookshop and the only reason I wrote about that because I found that image I found an image of a boy sat on a pile of rubble oh, wow. and I'm, I'm, my brain works quite cinematically I'm, I'm I, I am a I'm an avid watcher of films and, and, and the telly. So, you know, my brain works really well sort of visually. So I did a lot of it through that. Because I know that you were influenced heavily by a lot of classic children's books. Um, so does that mean that you did not read them beforehand because you didn't want to be influenced by them or you had just kind of had your memories? I know that for me, when I wrote Toffee, I was sort of thinking a little bit about The Pigman by Paul Zindel. 
and that I was really heavily influenced by that but I hadn't read it since I was 13. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was heavily influenced by my memories as a 13 year old but I didn't go back and read it because I was slightly afraid that I would end up drawing on it too much so is is that the way in which you were influenced by those books or did you actually go back and read them? No, I, I didn't. I stayed, I stayed clear. I, had, I mean, I didn't read Goodnight Mr. Tom as a, as, as, a, as a younger person or even The Machine Gunners. I watched it as a kid. Right. I, wasn't, I wasn't really a reader as a kid, you know, apart from Roy the Rover's uh, comic every week. <laughs> so, um, so, but what, I mean, I read Goodnight Mr. Tom for the last time, probably five or six years ago. But what I did try to do is kind of almost invert them in a way you know, because there are some people have mentioned the good night, Mr. Thompson Larry. Yes, it is about an unlikely relationship between a, a child and a person, but obviously in this case it's not it's not the kindly sort of John John Thor character, it's it's a it's a, a middle-aged woman. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, the boy traveling into London instead. So I was trying to invert it. That there is there is a machine gunner's um sort of illusion in there, which a few people have got, which has made me very happy because I I think you know. Those two books in particular are, you know, and there's others as well, you know, Maurice Gleitzman, uh, which is more than a quartet now, isn't it? I think it was almost like the sixth book coming out about Felix. They're incredible. So, but I didn't go back and read them consciously because I just didn't, I've never felt like I can write like those people. I can only write like, like I can, you know, I can write like me. Better you than know, them, Bill, better than I'll them. I'll try and hate them. I'll, I'll fall on my face very quickly. So you mentioned Mrs. F um, and that this is a really important relationship. Um, can you talk about that? And then I want to talk about Adonis afterwards, but can you just sort of talk about um, that relationship? Because it's kind of unlikely. And she, at the beginning, when we meet her, feels very tough. And like, maybe she, well, no, like firm but fair, <laughs> maybe. Um, but I did wonder when I, when I started the book, whether or not he would find his way to her and whether or not she would have the patience for him. Mm. Um, so, how did you develop that or why was that an important relationship for you to again for you to explore in, in the writing of this book I think I think you know the it's quite interesting I think in, in a lot of the books I, I've written the mother is quite an unsym, an unsympathetic character uh, or, or is indeed dead so you know saving Daisy um, unfortunately she's she's not there uh, Billy's mum gives her up in bubble wrap boy she's she's really uh, overpowering and overbearing and, um, and, and my mother's not like that, you know, she's absolutely not, she's as far away from that. She's watching, is that what she's watching? watching. <laughs> she's, she's probably hammered by now, it's fine. But, um, so, you know, it's, um, she'll be swearing at the telly now. Um, but I wanted, I, I, again, it's a kind of, it's a film thing. I really love films where there is an unlikely uh, parental child relationship that isn't your classic parental child you know I think we might get onto this anyway but you know what we end up with in this book I think is when you talk about things with a modern element is you you end up with the most dysfunctional family imaginable because you end up with four people in this family you end up with uh, Joseph an angry 12 year old evacuee who's been sent the wrong way you end up with Sid a young girl that he meets in the zoo who has something that's happened in her past and we don't know why she, we know she's lost someone too. You have Mrs. F who, who displays, you know, as much anger and as much resentment as Joseph does, but within a kind of adult psyche. And then you've got Adonis, who's this surly, impatient, you know, silverback gorilla. And it's almost like this kind of, it's almost like this kind of- Blended mad, family. <laughs> mad modern blended family. You know, we've got more animals in our house. You know, we've got you know, loads of us were bursting at the seams. But um, I, I, I it was a it was an amazing joy to try and bring that family together and again i don't know and, and if this is what i've done in the book it was purely unconscious but there is something again about healing in it and families coming back together it's not a surprise for me at all that as i started to write this book i met someone really special who helped me get over a lot of things do you know what i mean so it, yeah. it, it's not and, and, and by no means is is my partner no way is lou Mrs. F, that's not the that's not the link at all. But there is something in there about family. I didn't know as I was writing the book how Joseph was going to reach her. Because as I say, I really genuinely do not plan. For me, the greatest joy in writing is me being the first reader. I love that sentiment of 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 being on the roller coaster with the reader. Do you know what I mean? And it means poor Charlie, when she gets the first draft, has to go, my God, what is this cack? This like needs to like, oh. okay, but, um, that's the joy for me. 
Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I knew that he would, I knew that he would reach her and I knew that they would build this alliance, but I had no idea, even halfway through the book, how that was going to happen. But that's the exciting I guess that's thing. life, isn't it? Because when you end a relationship or something, you know, when everything falls apart, you can't really imagine it building itself back up again. You can't even imagine having those feelings you know, those warm feelings for anybody ever again. So yeah. I guess that we, you know, the Joseph is as surprised as you would be, you know, in, in your real life. And maybe yeah. that mimics that in some way, or it, re it reflects what was happening for you. Hugely, hugely way. ties into that. It ties back into those kids that I worked with in the children's homes, you know, their, their ability to trust any of us. You know, it, it's part of being Billy that the, the carers in being Billy, of which I was a carer, in a children's home they the kids used to call us um they were encouraged to call us uncle and auntie which was a really awful thing for them to be encouraged to call but they used to call us uncle and auntie scum do you know what i mean you know those kids their 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 trust has been obliterated from from first memories you know their first memories are nothing like ours so their inability or their reluctance to um to relate to trust to love is 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 limited but i think the book is about our even though we don't realise it all of us, it's like, without sounding like an idiot, we've got this huge propensity and ability and potential to love and be loved. It's just that journey of getting... And that issue of trust is one that is really explored through his relationship with Adonis. Yeah. Um, and so Adonis, uh, what I think might be nice now is if you read, would you like to read when he meets Adonis? Because I, I know that you... Is that a that nice was segue? Was that, that, was that good? I that think I did really pretty good. well, actually. <laughs> I'm going to put my very stylish glasses on, which might... Well, I would love if you'd also tell us what page you're reading from, because there may be some people who have a copy of the book and would like to follow along in the reading. Is that very nice. Um, I'm, starting, I'm starting three quarters of the way down um, page 30, mm -hmm. and uh, it will be slightly edited to cut out some of my waffle. But um, to give you a, just a hint of what it's about, so this is... Um, so Joseph is, is, has been Joseph is in the big city. He's been taken to the zoo for the first time. Mrs. F runs and owns the family zoo. Yet it is a pretty rundown place. Most of the animals have been either shipped out or killed because of the war. And Joseph is uh, angry and bored and he is walking up and down the length of this, what he thinks is an empty cage with a big stick in his hand. And he's rubbing this pole, the stick up and down the bars of the cage. And this is what happens. The echo of the metal was a pleasant one, almost musical, and Joseph enjoyed how the stick, bouncing off the bars, sent shudders up his arms and across his chest. He reached the end of the cage, spun on his heels, and started to rewalk its length, repeating the process, ignoring Mrs. F's second warning. But as he reached the middle of the cage, he felt the world spin on its axis. There was no warning, no siren, just a tsunami of movement and an ear-splitting noise. Something crashed against the bars, ripping the branch from his fingers and sending him skittering backwards in shock. The noise continued. Joseph had never heard anything like it. It tore at his ears, so loud that his hands flew to his lobes. What sort of place was this, he thought? What on earth was he doing here? Was it a punishment? Because he didn't deserve this, did he? The chaos didn't stop. Whatever was in the cage continued to throw itself against the bars, long hairy arms reaching through, clawing for the boy as he scuttled away on his hands and knees. It was a monkey, he thought. No, it was bigger than that, way bigger, angrier too. Angry enough to push Mrs F into action, moving towards the bars as Joseph dashed from them. Through gasping breaths, Joseph watched her walk slowly closer, arm outstretched, hand open and flat, but head lowered never once making eye contact with the monster inside. What was she doing? Had she not seen what was in the cage, the way it was behaving? It'd rip her apart, she was mad. Mrs F though appeared to be completely in control. As she neared the cage, her pace slowed further and she started to talk, well, make noises really, a succession of grunts, low and guttural, while the arm that wasn't outstretched snaked into a pocket. She reached the bars, a matter of inches from where the animal still rocked, agitated, and let herself slide down them, a mirror image of the animal inside the cage. Slowly, with her head still down, she took a carrot from her pocket and pretended to eat it. The animal watched her, its movements slightly blurred. 
sorry, slightly blunted. She pretended to take another bite and a third, and then almost in slow motion, she allowed her arm to reach through the bars, the beast's hand brushing hers as he took the carrot from her grasp. And then, nothing. The animal tucked into it while scratching at something on his belly. A flea, probably, Joseph thought, as he watched Mrs. F mimic him, her own hand rubbing at her stomach. The carrot lasted seconds, and before he'd even finished his final mouthful, the creature turned and stalked into the shadows. Mrs. F stood too, shaking the stiffness from her knees. Don't worry, Adonis takes some getting to know. You'll be cleaning his cage out in no time. You go in there? Well, he's actually in there too. Well, of course. I can hardly send him out for ice cream, can I? And he's not likely to shovel up his own muck if I leave him a spade. Sometimes I wait till he's asleep and sometimes not. It's all about trust. You won't catch me in there, he mumbled. Mrs. F didn't hear him, but she wasn't finished. Lesson number one, she said. Always listen to Mrs. F. There was a pause, a heartbeat. Lesson number two. Always listen to Mrs. F in the zoo, especially in the zoo. I'll tell you lesson number three as soon as I make it up. And without offering him a hand, she walked on, the stupid dog circling her. Joseph's eyes didn't leave the cage. He still couldn't comprehend what he'd seen. All he knew was that Adonis, if that was the name of the creature, clearly didn't like him very much, just like everyone else in his life. Thank you, Phil. That was amazing to hear you read that. It's very different. And um, you also read the audiobook. I did. That was like... Uh, that? that was brilliant. Uh, that's always been on my bucket list. And because uh, like, I did drama at, at, at uni, I didn't. Learn, I did English and drama at uni. But to be honest, I didn't do any English. I, I, I <laughs> it just wasn't for me. You know, I struggled, but you know, it wasn't a proper degree, so I had to. You know, but anything I learned about drama and dialogue and storytelling, I learned through, through drama. You know, and through going to the theatre as a kid. We used to have this place that's still there called Hull Truck. And there was a guy called John Godber there who's artistic director. And he used to write plays about bouncers and rugby league players and hairdressers and teachers. And, and uh, growing up in Hull, you're geographically quite isolated. And things like Narnia seem like a million miles. You know what I mean? It, that, that isn't yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. They weren't my people. John yeah. Godber's plays were full of my people. So I, I learned from him. He's a master at rhythm and dialogue. So if I'm well, even, you know. That's exciting so that people can actually listen to you read it as well. So yes, it's available on publication, publication day, unabridged, <laughs> seven hours. My dad's ordered three, so that's half the print run gone. So <laughs> get in there quick. So um, as you were reading, I just want to explain to people that I am looking at my phone, not because I'm ordering delivery, <laughs> but because I'm being sent through questions that are coming up on the chat because I haven't got access to that. So if you do have any questions for Phil, I haven't finished yet, but if you do have any, then I will be able to access those through my through my phone. Um, so please do put them on the chat, and I and we will get them. That would be great. Um, you talked a little bit, or you just touched on very briefly. Well, what I didn't say at the beginning is I didn't sort of talk about your whole career. I didn't give you a bio. I was meant to give your amazing bio at the beginning, and I I failed to do that. I was so excited just to get started with the talking. But obviously you have written early, everything from sort of early readers all the way through to much longer YA. Um, and this is your 20th book. Yeah. Um, and there is this fascination and seeming kind of obsession with the debut. But you've managed to do to, to achieve something incredible with your writing. And I haven't read anything of yours that is as good as this. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And... I hate to say it because it's really hard <laughs> for us to praise one another because we know how much the other person doesn't like hearing it. But it really is an incredible novel. Um, and when I finished it, I was emotional because I, I, I was so proud of what you'd been able to achieve. Um, you know, not despite everything that was going on, but just because it is in itself like a magnificent achievement. And we've got like Michael Morpurgo, deeply felt, movingly written, a remarkable achievement. You've got, I mean, everybody who's everybody has quoted for this book. Um, and I'm sure lots of other exciting news is going to be coming out soon about this book. How does that feel? What does it feel like in pre-publication to have such noise about a book after? And I'm not saying that the other books haven't had any, you know, 
um, fanfare yeah. at all. They certainly have, and and you've won prizes, but this nothing like this. And so, what? No. How does that feel like for your twentieth book? What do, what's what's it going feels, on? Um, it feels brilliant. It makes me feel really proud. Um, uh, I've I've made a really conscious decision very early on to to enjoy this process, whatever the process was. Um, but I got a, I just got a feeling, and you know we don't know what's going to happen when this book comes out. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Bookshops so far have been wonderful and really supportive. The, the pre-orders seem to be really nice, and that and that's terrific. But we don't know if it's going to achieve any kind of modicum of commercial success or critical success. But this has just felt it's felt different. It's felt different. I think, um, I think for I think I've allowed to put myself back in the book a little bit, uh, uh, and, and I think I did that with Billy, and I think I did that with some of the early books. But then I went younger and I wrote younger, and I think maybe, and uh, although this is third person as well, those books were third person, and I don't know whether it created a bit of distance, but um, I allowed myself permission to to put my own emotions, I think, back back into it. And I think, I don't know, it just, it feels like that's meant that people have related to it more because the themes that are in there, are, I guess, are pretty universal. You know, that thing of loss and family and, and, and desperately striving to belong and survive, you know, the, everyone feels those things at, at points in their life. So it's been unbelievably uh, overwhelming. And it's like working, so I've been working with Paul Black at, at Anderson and, and you almost, I almost feel getting embarrassed, like sending Paul, oh, I've got, I've got, another, got you another quote. <laughs> but it was, it was incredibly gratifying and I'm not the most, although I can often present as being massively confident, I don't have, uh, in the past, I've not had almost the, the greatest faith in my own ability as a writer or as a storyteller. But you must I mean, have known when you wrote this that there was something special. Like you must have known when you, you know, did that last full stop. Hold on a minute, this is different. I was just so happy to be writing again that I didn't know. I really didn't know. You genuinely didn't know that you'd written something special. No, I just knew that it felt great to have got from start to finish. And, and this was probably the first sort of, this was the first 70,000 word novel I'd written in, in probably four or five years. You know, I'd, I love working with Barrington Stoke doing books for, for dyslexic and reluctant readers. And then there would be the middle grade stuff, which was 30,000. So the feeling, um, the feeling of, of, of finishing something, even if it was a first draft, um, was, was, was the overriding feeling of relief that I could still do it, really. And then how do you go about writing afterwards? So you've had all this pre-publication buzz does that create pressure or is it exciting and it creates you know it gives you the energy to to write and to do better or do you think oh god I can only because <laughs> sometimes I, mean, I, worry, I feel like, I like oh I can only go downhill from here you know? <laughs> I worry about I worry about matching the, the intensity I mean it is quite an intense book yeah. I've got a really dear friend who lives just down the road who's a psychologist and he was just like Jesus Christ that it's like you know, how much misery can you throw at this poor kid um but no I well, mean hold I, on. I'm gonna just stop you just for one second because there is misery but there are all these little funny bits and little oh, yeah. light absolutely um that make it not you know I'm not I'm not very I'm not actually that keen on 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 books that are huge downers I say and <laughs> People will be like, what? You <laughs> have you read have you read Moon Rise? <laughs> but you have to have the light moments. And that's what I love about this as well. That it really it isn't about the darkness. It completely is about that slither of light in the corner that Joseph finds. Yeah. Um, and that Mrs. F can see in him. And that Sid can see in him actually really early on as well. Sid Sid so was that doing... conscious, was that conscious too that you yeah. didn't even though all these awful things were happening and the setting was quite grim that you were concerned to make sure that there was joy in the book yeah and the, you know I think it's important that there is joy there is humor and I think again that's my background that's the whole in me that you know because the, the, the whole sense of humor can be quite gruff and can be quite do you know what I mean it's quite an uncompromising place at times you know uh, and, and, and that's the, that's maybe the whole sensibility, I think. But yeah, there is always hope. I'm not interested in writing a book that isn't hope. And my God, I make you wait for it. You know, without doing spoilers, you really, you know, I think you're made to wait. But there are moments along the journey where where Joseph's potential starts to be just slightly exposed. And Sid is really the first one to expose it. Sid, um, again, I didn't plan Sid. Sid just appeared. She appeared and 
she was nearly lost from the first after the first draft because Charlie quite rightfully said she doesn't earn her place yet. She doesn't. She at the moment she's simply a plot device, and so we needed to really put flesh on Sid's bones. But I'm really pleased that I, I stuck, I dug my heels in and said I don't want to lose her because I think she is the first person. You know, she's the first person that starts to slide into Joseph's new family dynamic. She's the first one that starts to give him a little bit of roots, you know, a little bit of a foundation to build on. And it's Adonis and Mrs. F that kind of come after that. So she's really important. And I really love her. I think she's I think she's a really good character. I've got a question and then I think I'm going to look on my phone and see if okay. people have got questions. But you mentioned Charlie several times and Charlie yeah. talked about your friendship. What was that editorial process like? Because I know that it can sort of make or break a book and make or break an author's spirit. Yeah. <laughs> so what was that process like? Because from Charlie's perspective, it sounds but it sounds great, but now she's gone. <laughs> you can tell us what it was really like. What was it like? I mean, I think in, in, in 10 years of, of, of being published, you have different editorial relationships. And I was really lucky in my early career, you know, the first three books were edited by Shannon Cullen at, at, at Puffin, who uh was just understood me got me tried understood what i was trying to do and i never ever ever felt like a book across her desk do you know what i mean publishers are busy editors are busy their their workload is vast yeah. you know the days of the long literary lunches are gone these guys work incredibly hard and 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 but what i didn't appreciate with until since working with shannon until i got to this point is what a fundamental difference that process made to me. It was um, revelatory. And interestingly enough, you know, book two, the first draft or the next book, another World War II book is the first draft is done. And me and Charlie had our editorial meeting last night, sat where I am now. Uh, and already she is, even I haven't even started the rewrite yet, she has improved it fivefold, you know, because she just has that, she just understands story. Do you know and what I mean? Feel, you don't feel threatened by that relationship? Like no. You threatened by those notes or by that conversation absolutely not because i i know full well i this book when the sky falls would not have been anything like the book it's been without her editorial uh, guidance i've never worked so hard on a book she challenged me she pushed me also you know this is going to sound a bit crude but there are some editors that just blow smoke up your bum do you know what i mean they tell you you're great they, they tell you what your first draft is wonderful and what i love about charlie don't do that i got my edit back for the next book last week and the first sentence was hello lovely i've read it it's nice <laughs> and, and, and that for me that works for me because i'm like I, it's going to be more than bloody nice I'll, I'll you know what i mean but she she um and i said to you earlier she she gave me this thing of the view up here she said is lovely but are you prepared to to to, to do the work and, yeah. and that for me is is brilliant because i want to improve as a writer you know and i do think like when i go to schools until recently if they said what's your favorite book i always say they're all my favorite because they all came from my head and that was the truth can't say that anymore Th this is my favorite book this is this is without doubt the best thing i've written and I'm not saying that as an arrogant, I'm not saying it's brilliant, but to me, this and is... You're allowed to say that. You're allowed yeah. to say that. And it's not well, something you've said it say before. before. So I'm really, it, I mean, I think that's incredible that you've got to that space and it has taken 20 books for you to be able to say that. But the only reason I think I can say it, mate, is, is, is because, because I did the work. I can yeah. hand on heart walk away from this book saying that me and Charlie, Charlie didn't let this go to copy edit until she went, you're done. And I would have got, I would have done another five rounds of it yeah. if she told me to I would have sworn but I would have done it because I I implicitly I'm really setting myself up for this next book now it's going to be in edits for years but you know <laughs> she innately understands story yeah yeah right can we go to a question because I had read a question that I quite like go on then. and it might seem like a, a silly question but it's that it the book feels really cinematic so who would your dream cast be for an adaptation of the book Man, that that's a difficult one because I don't really know any young actors <laughs> I don't know who'd play the kid I mean like one of, one of my favorite uh one of my favorite directors is a guy called Shane Meadows who made yeah, 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 yeah. and the virtues and dead man dead man's shoes and stuff like that um the, the, the kid who played the skinhead in this is England would probably make a very good Joseph of that of that time but he's like 30 now 
Um, yeah, that's the problem. I only know old actors. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I mean, obviously Adonis would have to be played by Andy Serkis because any gorilla movie in Hollywood is made is, is played by him. That would be nice. Uh, or Vin Diesel. You get Tony McGowan in to do that. <laughs> Tony would do it in a heartbeat. I'd do it compared to me in Frazzles. Um, Mrs. F is an interesting one, though. I do, I would, um, Mrs. F, there are two actresses who I, I love. So either... Um, Samantha Morton, I think, is incredible, uh, and uh, her background interests me. The, the, the things that she has made herself as a director really interest me. Uh, but for pure bums on seats, I'd be quite happy if if um, Olivia Coleman was was available. That would be. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, she would, that be, would, be cool. she would bring some into it. The, the Mrs. F, by the way, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, you know, but Mrs. F to the people watching um, is named after my, one of my very favourite authors, and no one's cottoned onto it yet. So it'll be quite. You're not going to tell people who it no, is. No, no, no. <laughs> and you've been trying to get me to send it to them, and I dared. <laughs> like Don't send it. Die of embarrassment. Okay, another question is um, from Hannah Sycamore. She's she's delighted to be here, and she said that the anger of Joseph is palpable. She can feel it coming off the page, and she asked, "How did you find it writing Joseph's anger?" Um. For you. I never ever found it difficult or uncomfortable. Uh, and it was the same when I was writing Billy. Um, it, it, it's interesting, actually, I think, you know, if I'm being honest, going through the stuff that I went through before I started writing this book, that was really, if I'm honest, the first time in my life that I felt rage, honestly, genuinely felt rage, literally felt like I'd been set on fire. Uh, and, it, and it took me, it, it took me a couple of years for that feeling to kind of pass. And, and so I think it, it probably allowed me to, to, for it to sit quite comfortably with me that it's all right to feel like that. You know, Joseph has every reason to feel like he does. You know, that, that, that thing of being abandoned, that thing of being walked away from is, is, is one of the hardest things you can experience in life. And so it felt, it felt justified. And then, but, but the greatest joy was getting into page 300. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it with those kids time and again, that potential is there and it would be ridiculous for me to say that you can reach them every time, but a lot of those kids can be reached and their life can be altered. Their trajectories can be changed in a different direction. So it's, it's good. Well, I guess to sometimes they can't. And so it's nice to be able to write a situation where it has changed as well. Yeah. So the disadvantaged um, young people at risk of going to prison and sometimes you feel like you can't affect the change that you would like to affect yeah. the way we can write the things that we maybe can't do sometimes as well Absolutely. I mean I, when when people talk to me about my books they say gosh you're so jolly you and you write these really dark books <laughs> you haven't seen me in my house you haven't seen me <laughs> sobbing at 11 a.m <laughs> oh, yeah. a bottle of wine in my hand absolutely yeah. I mean you come live in our actually, house. I think, what, sorry, say that again. Come, come and see what Lucy's and me every day, and you'd soon, you know. And I think that's the thing. I wonder whether, to some extent, like when you, you, I said to you, you're not an angry person, but maybe writing is a place for you to do the things that you don't express yeah. in your life. Because I know that for me, that is a little bit the case that I have lots of darkness, but I, I have to write it. I don't really want to be yeah, 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 yeah. throwing it at people. You know. I've got a lot braver in the last few years at being honest and, and, and allowing myself to, to be a bit more open about those things. But it's it's um it is interesting that the, the strongest responses I've had in my writing career has been when I've been writing about these angry kids. So yeah. you know, no, note to self. But know. actually that 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 leads us to a question from Dom Conlin, who says that it feels a struggle that those it feels that those who struggle in the way that Joseph does would actually benefit from reading the book yet they also are those who are most difficult to reach. And do you think, mm. says, how can that be changed? Or do you think that can be changed? I would yeah, ask, do you think that can change? It can always be changed, but it, 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 if you want to, if you want to optimize that change or, or maximize the, their potential, then you need to invest in it. You know, I mean, for me, the greatest, the, for me, the greatest school events are the, are, are the ones in the schools that have got the least. Do you know what I mean? The kids, you know, I've done a lot of, I've, I've been very lucky to speak in a lot of very grand schools and I enjoy the experience very, very much, but there is nothing more special. Like, uh, for example, at Edinburgh Festival, they do an outreach thing. And I've done it twice now. And, and they took me to both times to the same Young Offenders Institution. And, and they said, I'm really sorry, but it's only a small group. It's like four or five young people. 
And I said, that's, that's fine. And they said, you might only be in there for 10 minutes. Because they said, if it kicks off, we need to get you out of there and calm them down. But both times that I went, and this isn't necessarily to do with me, but it's at both times I was in there for an hour and I've never walked out of a room feeling more rewarded because those, th those kids had never met an author in, in, in their life. You know, a lot of the, you know, for example, in, even in state schools, they're meeting an author every couple of times a year or once a term or whatever. Um, the fact that I was able to sit in a room with those kids who, who'd never even probably read a book, you know, but, but could recognise that they weren't that dissimilar, you know, that's, there's power in that for me. So, yeah, th those are the special moments. That people who are disadvantaged somehow will not be able to connect with the arts, um, which always proves to be untrue. I mean, there's this incredible podcast, I'm not going to be able to remember it now, but it's about them doing um, Shakespeare plays in uh, high security prisons. And, the, and, and I think a lot of these people are sort of um, in for murder and rape and awful crimes, but how they connect to the play in the way that we couldn't because they have lived all these feelings. Um, and so to imagine that young people who maybe just are slightly disadvantaged and um, are in poverty couldn't connect to art is... Just sort of need to offer them. And like you, when I go into schools that are, you know, the schools in the areas that people don't want to go into, they're always the best events because yeah. the kids are, they're wild and just brilliant and they respond so passionately. Um, one way or the other. So yeah, I completely recommend Also, it's that. like that's where the good that's where the good stuff lies yeah. for me yeah. personally. That's where, you know, it's like if if you can find the biggest torch you can and shine it into the darkest shadowy corners, that's where you find for me, that's where I find the stuff that moves me or excites me, gets my heart racing, makes me feel like I want to spend six months in this shed writing about it. Do you know what I mean? It's that and that's why I think career authors are so important. And I hate to go on, I like to talk about celebrity authors in your, on your night, but you need a career authors to be going into schools, to be doing that work, to, you know, we know the importance of it and, and we're Absolutely. prepared to put that work in. And I think that's, you know, if, if we kill the career author, we're going to kill that as well. Anyway, that's my, that's my political thing for the night. We are both. <laughs> I haven't mentioned Dominic Cummings yet, but we'll come to that. Um, from Sarah M., <laughs> Um, if you were to write more historical fiction, what which time period would you write? I like that question. That's a good one. Um, I'm I'm going. So the next one is 1940s. Um, again, so it's 1939. Uh, so the next, the next. Do you want me to do a little thing about the next book? Is that is that interesting? Yes, definitely. I would love to. I thought it was secret, so I didn't. I wasn't going to ask. Yeah, it's all right. So the next book is 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 just come back from Charlie with with a lot of red pen. Uh, and it doesn't have a title yet because I, I'm a salesman, by the way, for a publisher and sales have said no. So I've got to go back and start again. Um, but um, it's been, in 1939, as war broke out, the government sent a, um, a document, uh, like a pamphlet to every household in the UK saying, have your animals put down. It's not going to be safe for them. And so in September of 19, uh, 1939, uh, 750,000 animals were, were put to death. And so I just, oh. and it was Charlie that gave me that idea because there's a dog in When the Sky Falls called Tweedy and Charlie put in her first editorial note, you do realise, Phil, don't you, that um, animals, uh, most animals were put down. And I didn't know that. So again, Charlie, thank you. And so this is about one kid who says, well, I'm not having that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put the animals down. I'm going to save as many as I can. So it's a quest book. It, I want it to be tonally different. I want it to still have heart. I want it to be gritty. But um a book that I really admired over the last few years was, was The Good Thieves by Catherine Rundell. Yeah. I, lo I love epic adventure stories, yeah. uh, especially period ones. So I'm trying to write a, a, a period adventure story, I guess. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, a lot of work to do. Um, I think if I was going to go into another time period, I think it would be the, I think it would be the 80s. Right. Um, the, the, there's an idea that comes from Hull, uh, which I'm still toying with about um, there was uh, Hull was a lot of uh, many streets in Hull were like two up two downs you know terrace 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 yeah. terrace and there was one street that they wanted to pull down it's in, in its entirety in the 1980s and there was one guy that lived on the street called Barry Nuttall right what a brilliant name for a character and Barry was known I believe this is right was known anyway for driving around in Cadillacs and being really obsessed with like American culture and stuff he's really into Elvis and that and so he set up his own like American style militia to save his terrace. 
and all these guys and women, they were dressed up like, like you know, like Matt, like they're wearing mash, like almost in like Vietnam. Kind of. <laughs> and, and they said barricades. And it's like, there's something in that as well. So 80s, but 40s. First, Charlie's probably sat there saying, Phil, that's I'd like you to do 80s because then you could have a launch party in real life and we could wear leg warmers, listen to aha. I'm all about it. I'm there. I'm there. That's my 40s would be good too, though. We could still have a party. I have been trying to convince you to have a launch party, so I'm still hoping that we can have a launch party for this. I'm going to ask you one more question. Okay. Um, Sarah Webb. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Why do you think historical middle grade is having a moment? It does seem to be having yeah. a moment, doesn't it? It does. It does. And uh, but, uh, I think because there are, I don't know. Is it, is it because, is it because the real, the, the, the career authors are trying to go places where perhaps other celebrity authors don't? I don't know. I mean, I just think we have an incredible amount of very gifted writers writing in that arena at the moment. I mean, I'm reading Hilary Mackay at the moment and it's yeah. Oh, yeah. incredible. And, you know, look at Emma Carroll, and, and, and what she's done, uh, Elizabeth Vine back in, you know, a few years ago with, with you know, Code Code and Verity. It's, it's rich. For, for, for me, what's really interesting, actually, is if you read Hillary's books, for example, um, it, it's about the small stuff that comes out of big world events. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's the same for me, writing about, so, someone said to me, why aren't you writing, like, Dunkirk stuff or VE Day stuff? And it's like, because that's not the stuff that, that interests me. I'm interested in, in the little mundane things almost that come out of those big world events. You know, well, that... it's really interesting you're saying that because I often don't read historical fiction that's set in the Second World War because it feels quite national, nationalistic. A national, yeah. There's like a nationalism to it or something. Um, and there's nothing about that in this book. It just feels like a very human book. It's not a British book. You know, yeah. obviously you're a British author, but I don't you know, I don't read it in that way, which makes it really interesting because it's set in the war, but it's not really about that. It's about connection and shared humanity and not even shared humanity, shared beingness um, and like being in the universe with other living things and what, and what that means and how we need to embrace that and protect it rather than destroy it. And everything is being destroyed around them, like actually literally being destroyed. Yeah. And they're trying to create something and save something, which makes, you know, and I think particularly coming out of Brexit and coming out of the pandemic, it feels like a really apt book. And it feels like, it, you know, for me, that's why it speaks to today. That's why it feels like such a modern book um, and why it will speak to young readers. Because I think there is also this, worry that when a book is very literary and as brilliant as this is, will it speak to young people in the same way that it speaks to the critics like Michael Morpurgo? And I think absolutely it will because it feels so modern. Um, and because I think kids are feeling that kind of sense of being trapped and the world falling around, falling apart around them in the same way that Joseph does and feel angry. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of young people are gonna be coming out of this, you know, last 12 months or 16 months feeling really, really angry. Um, we haven't got loads of time. It's already five past seven. But I, what I want to ask you is, is it true you're visiting 60 bookshops in the next few weeks to do signings? Yes, I have. Uh, I have a bottle of sanitizer this big and a mask, <laughs> full body mask. Uh, yeah, no, I am. I'm, uh, uh, it's like it's been it's been it'll become clear in the next sort of few days now what's going on. But it's like. Uh, I've waited for this, mate. Do you know what I mean? It's like, um, I just want, uh, this is, this is my, it's like, it's like buddy dreamland, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? People have been so positive and people have got in touch and been really warm about it. So I just want to, you know, I, I don't go in a lot of bookshops anymore because I get really, I get really, you know, I don't find a lot of my books in bookshops a lot of time. Lou gets so cross with me because I walk out of places chuntering. But, you know, it's like, I really... Want... We all do that. We all... It's normal, Lou. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to really... I, I've been so bad in the past at allowing, allowing myself to enjoy, um, you know, because, you know, Marcus Sedgwick, who I love more than life, he's such a good friend, and he always says to me, don't fall into that trap of I'll be happy when, as in I'll be happy when I'm published, I'll be happy when I write a book that wins an award, I'll be happy when it's made into a film, I'll be happy when I'm rich. Yeah. Don't fall into that trap. And I did, I, you know stop putting obstacles in front of yourself and enjoy it. And if I can't enjoy this, then, you know, I'm bonkers. So yeah, I'm, I've got, I've got a full tank of petrol. I've got a six pack of frazzles and I'm hitting the road. 
<laughs> Basil's will last me till I get to Todmorden, five miles down the road. <laughs> well, I am so honoured that I got to launch this book with you. And when you say if you can't enjoy it, then, you know, who knows what you can enjoy. But I really hope that you can enjoy the publication of this book. It's so special. I am genuinely feeling emotional and proud of you tonight. Um, the book is out on what exact date? So you'll probably see it appearing in bookshops um, from now. This weekend. Yeah, um, yeah. But the official release date is next Thursday, the 3rd. The 3rd. Yeah, and it's and available as, yeah. I'm just going to do the, the sales bit. So it's from Anderson Press. It's available in all good bookshops and on audio, Kindle, and obviously, but I would suggest that you go out and buy a, um, a nice hard copy because um, you, you want to have it in your hands. It's, it's really beautiful. It's a lovely art object to, to own. Um, thank you to everybody who um, has joined us for this launch. Hopefully we will see you at some point in the future. And I'm really hoping that Phil and I get to kind of hang out in the future and hang out with all of you guys um, to celebrate this book properly in real life with something more than alcohol free beer. Because <laughs> it doesn't have a kick to it that I need. Um, but I love you loads, Phil. So proud of you. So proud to be your friend. Um, go and buy the book. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Take Thanks, care. Bye.